So let's get some items added to our order. So let's go back to our form. I'm going to actually go to the event handler and I'm going to go ahead and delete these comments from earlier. And what I like to do is I like to start out by putting comments in that kind of walks through mentally. I think to myself, what is the flow or what is the direction I'm trying to achieve with this button? So when this form appears for someone, uh, the clerk, let's say behind the counter, they're going to put in the name of the product, the price, the quantity of the items purchased, and then hit add to order. And my goal is to take the con, uh, the contents here, put it into a sales order item, add it to the sales order. And then ultimately I want those items to be listed in this list box. So how do I migrate or move that data from point A to point B? So how do I first capture the data in this side of the form and put it into a sales order and or sales order item? So to do that, I actually have to be able to grab the data from each one of these text boxes. Now, as I click on these boxes, you'll notice that the properties box says text box one, text box two, text box three. The reason for that is that each one of these boxes can have its own unique name. And that name is really just the name of the variable that that box instance lives in. So instead of calling it text box one, I'm going to call it txt product name. Now you may read around and some people will say, don't use um, what's called Hungarian notation. And Hungarian notation is this idea of putting the TXT in front of the name of the variable. And that was historically used for things like every time you'd write a piece of code and you would declare a variable, you would put the data type of that variable in front of it. So all your strings would have str, all of your integers would have int, and you get the idea. Well, that's kind of fallen out of practice and they say it's not really necessary because your variables should be either contextual or they should be strongly descriptive so that way you can look at the variable and know or kind of infer what type of data is in it. And generally, that's a better rule of thumb. With controls on a form, however, you can end up where you have the same control. No, you have different controls with the same name or similar name. So for example, if this is the box, the text box for price, well, this label would also be for price. But how would you be able to distinguish, distinguish between whether you're looking at the label control or the text box? <clears throat> now some would say, well, you would put price text box and price label as their names. Well, that's fine, but then that becomes a lot more to type, especially when you get long and complicated controls. So what I've come up with is kind of a shorthand. So TXT for text box price labels. If you wanted to actually give your labels a name, if they were interactive in some way, you could say LBL price as a label. Now these are my conventions. You're welcome to use your own. But I've found over the last number of years of doing this, um, they're very effective. So TXT quantity. And then our button, we can go ahead and actually give it a name as well. So this can be BTN add to order. All right. So we double click on our button, brings us back into our event handler. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to check for an existing sales order. And I'm just going to kind of walk through this and then we'll actually write the code to make it work. And then from there, we will capture text box data and store in the sales order item object. Then we'll add the sales order item object to the sales order. Let's actually go ahead and say the active sales order. And then the final step will be to list all sales order items in the list box. All right, so pretty straightforward. Four steps that gives us everything that we need to get this functionality in place. So our form, if we come back up to the top for a minute here, you'll notice that our form is simply a class, just like all of our other classes that we just created, our sales order and sales order item. This class inherits from a base class of form. 
This base class comes with the .NET framework and it lives inside of the namespace of system.windows.forms.form. Not completely necessary to know that, but to have that as an understanding and something to kind of put in the back of your mind because that's that inheritance that our form one inherits from form, that's why our code is able to function the way it is because that ability to draw a little window and do all of the drag and drop and all that work, that was actually written by a person or a team of people at Microsoft who created this form class. So they actually <laughs> did all of that work. So your little Windows form application is sitting on the shoulders of giants as they say. You're utilizing all of that code that was written and shipped as part of the .NET framework. Um, this is our constructor. We'll talk more about those later. And then back here in our button, this is our um, event handler. Now, if we want a sales order to persist beyond just the button click, but we want that sales order to exist as long as the form is there, we need to keep in mind things like scope. So every, wherever you declare a variable, when it's between two sets of curly brackets, like right here, that variable only exists as long as you're running code between those two curly brackets. The moment that you hit that last bottom curly bracket and you exit that function, that variable will no longer exist. It falls out of scope is the term they use. And so you'll see that there's curly brackets up here at the namespace level curly brackets at the class level, and then there's curly brackets at the method level. There's also curly brackets when you get into doing things like loops and if statements. So wherever a variable is declared, and the declaration of a variable is just this part on the left hand side of the equal sign. So sales order SO is the declaration of the variable. That's us defining the bucket where we're going to put our data. Now what I want to have happen is that if I put data in this SO bucket, for the sales order, I want that data to live beyond this button click. So I'm going to actually take the declaration of the variable, sales order SO, I'm going to cut it. I'm going to move it up here and make it the first line within our class. I'm going to give it a little better name. I'm going to call it order. And that way it at least makes a little more sense instead of it just being an SO. Then we're like, what's an SO? I don't know. All right, so then what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to come up here where it says check for an existing order. I'm going to say if order, order being this order up here, equals null. Null is undefined. I'm going to say order equals new sales order. Now this is called the instantiation of an object. So sales order itself is a class, and you can think of a class as a blueprint. It's the blueprint that defines what an object in your code looks like. So we've defined this object sales order, or this class sales order, and this is the blueprint. So now in our form, we're actually going to go through the process of creating an instance of that. So we're going to take that blueprint and actually create those memory spaces in our code and actually drop that object into memory and then assign it to our variable order. So order is now looking at this chunk of memory and anytime we want to interact with that memory, reading and writing data to it, we do it via the variable, in this case order. So if an order does not exist, is what this says, then create a new sales order. So now we have an order and we can now add, create our sales order item that we can then add to the order. So we'll start out with a declaration of a sales order item, and I'm going to call it an SOI. And we'll say we need a new one. So here we've declared the variable SOI, and we've created an instance of a sales order item, and we're storing that new object instance in the SOI variable. So now SOI has a series of properties. It has product name, quantity, and price. So we'll start off by saying product name equals, and we'll do txt product name dot text. And the text is the field where the input data will be. All right. And then we have two more properties. So we have soi dot price equals txt price. Whoops. T 
txt price dot text semicolon soi dot quantity equals txt quantity dot text. Now you're probably looking at this and going, that's not good when it underlines things in red, is it? It's not. That's actually a compiler warning telling us that we have something going on that's wrong in our code. So before we go too far ahead of ourselves, let's take a look at what we have. If you mouse over the red squiggle, here it says, cannot implicitly convert type string to float. So what's happening here is that txt price.txt, this text property gives us back a string. And you can see that by clicking on that property. So you, you see the definition of a string is a return type. Textbox.text .text is the definition of that property for the textbox class. <laughs> and then on the other side, we have our sales order item, SOI. It has a price property, and that price is of type float. It's a number, it's an integer number, or it's a decimal number. So what happens is we have to then take this string, text string, and convert it into a float so that we can store it in the float variable. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, there are best practice ways to handle conversions, but for the time being and the length of this lecture video, I'm going to go ahead and kind of do it the quick way, which is simply to call float dot parse. And this parse method is a, what's called a static method. And it takes a string and it will convert, it will attempt to convert that string into a float. And we'll do the same thing down here. We'll do uint dot parse and we'll parse that quantity into an unsigned integer. Now, I will tell you right now, this by itself is not the best way to do it. It will cause big errors if a number is not put into these two text boxes. It will actually cause your app to blow up and crash. So be aware that that is a thing, and that can cause some major issues. I'm doing this for time, not for accuracy. I will show you later how to properly handle those numbers so that you're parsing and handling them in a way that is, um, it keeps your app up and running and then you can provide feedback and warnings to your end user. All right, so let's go ahead now and we'll add that sales order item that we just created to our sales order. So we'll say order dot items. And you remember items was our list of sales order items. Think of it kind of like an array, but this is an array that you can actually grow and expand. I believe in Java they called them array lists. So this list is like an array list in Java. So order.items dot and then the list has a method called add that allows us to add a new sales order item to it. And then we'll just say SOI. So we've now added our sales order item to the order. And then the last step <clears throat> will be for us to actually take those items and load them into that list box that's on the right hand side. So if we jump back here, we'll see there's this list box. The list box itself is called list box one. I'm going to call this LST order items. So again, just changing the name of that list box variable to be something that's a little more descriptive. All right, so let's jump back over to our code here. And then we can say LST order items. And then we can say dot. And there's an items property here that we can use to actually populate. And let's go ahead and do that. And that'll allow us to look at using loops. So the first thing we want to do is we want to clear out any items that are currently in that list box. <clears throat> the next thing that we want to do is we'll want to do a for loop. And that for loop will allow us to loop through the contents of the order items. So we'll do four. And the syntax for a for loop looks like this. It usually starts off with an integer i at zero. And then from there, we define that we want to loop while i is less than, and basically it ends up being less than the size or length or count, depending on what kind of collection you're dealing with, of the list in question. So in this case, we're looking at order.items, and we are looking at the count. 
to that count property tells us the number of elements or items inside of our order items collection. All right, so the idea here again is that I will start at zero and that's where your arrays or your collection start is at zero. So the first position in that array is zero. So we're going to start at the first position and we're going to loop or count up to the size of the collection. Now this is a less than. So what that means is that we're going to start at zero and we're going to go all the way up to this number minus one. So if this number is five, let's say, we're going to count from zero to four, zero being the first item. So zero, one, two, three, four. That ends up, if you count that on your fingers, that's five. Zero is your thumb, one your index, two your middle, three your ring, four is your pinky. That's actually five items that you counted. <clears throat> so we're going to loop from zero to whatever the size of the collection is, minus one. So to do that now, what we're going to do is a series of steps. We're going to say uh, order dot items and then use a square bracket to access the indexer of that collection. So here we're going to say order dot items of I. So that will give us back a sales order item. And we'll just call it SO item, just so we have a different type of name. <clears throat> and then we're going to say LST orders dot items dot add. Now the list box is a very generic type of control. So when we call add, you'll see in the method signature here to the right, it says that it takes as a prop as a sorry as an argument it takes an object item so some item variable of type object everything within the dotnet framework inherits from the object class so you basically this is saying give me any type of variable and i will put it in the list so we'll say add and we will add our so item from above so we're now taking that sales order item and we're putting it in the list. And then once that loop finalizes or finishes, then we'll exit the event and then we'll be on our way. So let's go ahead and run this real fast and see how it works. So we'll hit start and let the compiler run and do its thing. And once it's compiled, we'll go ahead and say, um, I don't know, pack of gum price 50 cents and we'll set the quantity to one and add it to the order and looks like something happened here let's take a look and see object reference is not set to an instance okay so what happened here is that we have our if we mouse over here into our debugger mouse over order we'll see that there's an object here. If we mouse over items, and I know that little red X is kind of in the way, <clears throat> mouse over items, and you'll see here to the right of the X, it says null. That means that the items collection is not defined. So this is causing a null reference exception. So we can't call add on something that is null. So to correct that, we'll stop. We'll go back to sales order. And what we need to do is we need to initialize items. To do that, we have to do it in what's called a constructor. In a constructor, I like to use the CTOR snippet. If you hit double tab after you type CTOR, R, it will create a method that has the same name as your class. And it looks like this. From here, you can initialize all of your members to a default value. Well, integers automatically default to zero date and time automatically default to the beginning of time so there's no need to force initialization but if we wanted to we could do underscore order created equals date time dot now so whenever the object is created we capture the order created date and then what we'll need to do here as well is we'll need to do items equals new list of sales order items so that will initialize this collection 
when we create our new sales order object. And that then in return will make it so that we can call add, add our sales order item, and then make our way through the rest of our code. So let's save, hit start, recompile, and we'll give it a second go. So we'll say pack of gum, be 50 cents, and then we'll add a quantity of one and we'll hit add to order. And we have an item show up in our list. Um, it looks like cp underscore first windows app dot models and then kind of gets cut off there what's happening is that our object is getting added to the box but the box doesn't know how to render out that sales order item it's just saying i'm just going to dump the name of the class into the box and make that the text so we need to kind of walk through how to make that more visually appealing All right, so let's stop our code again, and then we're actually gonna jump over to sales order item, and this is where we're going to help the list box know how to present the item. Now, I said a little bit ago that each object in the framework inherits from object, and that's done implicitly. We don't have to go up, he up here and say colon object and say we're inheriting from object. That just happens automatically. And because of that, there are four methods that come along for the ride. Those methods are two string. Um, they are equals. They are get hash code. And I forgot the fourth one. <laughs> Actually, there's just the three. Fourth one kind of comes along for the ride occasionally. It's usually like the compare to, but it has to do with what objects you're dealing with. So the three are equals get hash code and two string. So what we want to override is two string. So what I did there is I wrote the word override, I hit space, two string, and those other two options came up. I went ahead and moused on to two string and then Visual Studio went ahead and created a method stub for me for this override. So by default, the override will basically just call the base class dot two string, which is the default functionality. That default functionality is to name the name of the class, which is what we saw in the list box, and that is not what we want. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to return product name plus, and then we're going to want to probably do some space plus, and then we can do the quantity plus more space plus, <clears throat> and then that unit price. So we'll do that as price. We'll hit save there. So what will happen is that those three variables will get concatenated together into a single string and that's what will show up when we run our program. So let's hit start again and take a look at what we've got. So we can say a pack of gum. The price again is 50 cents and the quantity will be one. We'll hit add to order. And there we go, a pack of gum, one item, 50 cents. The formatting's a little funky, but you get the idea. We can move things around to make it a little clearer. We can make other adjustments as well. So maybe it's easier to move the quantity up front. Oop, too far. <clears throat> we can add maybe like a line break here, and then we can do things like add some basic formatting for the price. We'll hit start again one more time time. Oh, I've got a compiler issue. Got two plus signs now. Let me drop one of those and I need to add a plus sign here. Make sure I got things in balance. Hit start again. So pack of gum for 50 cents. We'll have a quantity of one and we'll hit add to order. So now we have that pack of gum. We have one pack of gum for 50 cents added to our order. We can add another item. Uh, we could say uh, soda for a dollar and hit add to order again and it comes out with our one dollar soda. So you get the idea. We can continue adding items to the order. Now what would be convenient though is that at the very bottom here you know we're putting all these items into the order if it would give us the total for the order. It would take the quantity times the unit price 
figure out that price, and then give us multiples, and then add them together into the order. So let's do that next.